everyone and welcome to your Freedom Hub's presentation of the cash patient. I am your host Jeff Cantor along with my co-host Charles Froman. We are sponsored by a number of entities and we are the location where all the disruptors and entrepreneurs collide. Hopefully we're going to create a little better world out of all of that activity. These are being recorded for posterity. This is the channel if you're not currently subscribed to get weekly notices of all the upcoming events please go to this link. The other three links, we post these videos over the weekend. So typically every Monday morning, they're up there ready to go. And just to show you what we're talking about, this is where we are up on the Brighteon network, up on BitChute, then and also featured on YouTube. We are sponsored, as I said, by your Freedom Hub, where you'll want to come see. And then also new is the fact that we have the marketplace available. And this is a great publication that you're going to want to stay on top of. Um, I believe on this page, and we're moving some things around here because it's just newly released, but this is the reminder page about these events. Here's a list of who's here, and notice Jim's got his little write-up on here as it turns out. And then also the list of all who's coming into the future and stuff, and you'll be able to catch some past videos, and all these tabs have a lot of stuff, and you're going to see this drop downs being added all the time to these, so you're going to want to come back to this mphealthwealthfreedom.com for sure. And then before we dig into today, let me just show you, we also picked up another corporate sponsor. We've got the only bioenergetic hemp product we discovered. We've been searching the planet and this is the only one of its kind that exists because it's completely active instead of being inert. It is a completely bioenergetic and bioactive product, but you can certainly figure that out for your own self. You can go up on their site, scope it out and we negotiate for them to give us a 15% discount as opposed to five or 10. And this is the code you'll use in the checkout. And just to show you real fast, this is their particular site with some great videos and some unbelievable demonstrations of what this does to people with their problems and stuff. So you'll, you'll appreciate that quite a bit. Now let's dig into where we are today, because this is going to make for some very interesting conversations. So we're all pretty excited about this. So, you know, we're in the throes of healthcare reform for why? Well, we had COVID. We're in the throes of what's going to happen at the back end of ACA. We're in an election cycle. There's a lot going on. So James Bacon, Jim's going to give us a big rundown here. He's founder of the Bacon's Rebellion, which is a blog of his. He's also an author in the past of Boomergeddon, and then also had been an editor with Virginia Magazine. To give you a little taste of what that looks like, here's this book that he'd published some time ago. And what's most current for him is his spot on blog that he posts. So with that note, we're going to let Jim fill in the gaps for us here. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And now you have permission there, Jim, to open up yours to us. Okay. So, uh, you know, uh, welcome, welcome to this webinar and, and thanks for having me so much. Uh, I, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about the political economy of healthcare. Um, Virginia business, I mean, Virginia, <laughs> Baker's Rebellion has a, has a uh, focus on Virginia public policy and we've been delving into healthcare in Virginia uh, for a number of years uh, and developed a pretty good uh, feel for what's going on here. Uh, each state is unique. Each state has a unique public policy environment, different legislation and so on and so forth. But because of the, the, um, the distribution of regulatory responsibilities between federal and state governments, many of the patterns that we see in Virginia uh, are replicated in many other states. So, um, Hopefully, uh, this will be relevant to so the, those of you, the guests uh, who come from outside of Virginia. Uh, my starting point is um, this, this chart right here, this map. Uh, it, it, has, uh, it was developed in 2017 by the Commonwealth, uh, uh, by Commonwealth Fund and uh, 
it uh, describe it shows the uh, average amount of uh, private family health insurance premiums that were paid in each state. And uh, as you can see in Virginia, there were a total of $26,000 a year, either in premiums or out-of-pocket expenses. Now the premiums include both the employer share and the employee share, but one way or other, it comes out of the employee's pocket at the end of the day. So $26,000 a year is a lot of money, particularly when you figure that the average household income in Virginia is about $70,000. So it's uh, uh, equivalent to a third of the average family's income. So the question obviously arises, why so expensive? Why is healthcare insurance so expensive? Um, the US healthcare system outside of the, uh, the Gulf states, I believe, is probably the most expensive healthcare system in the world. Virginia's healthcare system is among the most expensive in, uh, among the states in the US. <laughs> Why? So to, bar to uh, borrow a phrase from uh, James Carville uh, back in the uh, Clinton campaign, uh, when he said it's economy stupid, I just make a slight variation on that. It's the political economy, stupid. It's the power structure and the regulatory structure that flows from the power structure. Basically what we have in Virginia, and I'm sure it's pretty much the same in every state, is government of the special interests, by the special interests, for the special interests. Now the healthcare in the United States uh, has two levels of influence. One is the federal level, one is the state level. The federal government through Medicaid, Medicare, uh, the Obamacare market exchanges is by and large is concerned with how do we pay for healthcare or who pays. So the federal level kind of affects the demand side, so to speak. The, at the state level, that's where uh, it affects more the delivery of health care. Um, and so we may say in a sense that state regulations to, uh, affect and influence the supply side of the health care sector. And it's doesn't get nearly as much attention as the, the, the federal initiatives, but it's every bit as important. Now, the three things I'm going to explore today, uh, and there's more I could explore, but these are the ones I'm going to focus on. It's going to be hospital competition, or the lack of it, price transparency, or the lack of it, and professional licensure, which is basically uh, the, what, what's behind the craft unionization of the healthcare industry. So uh, let's focus on hospital competition first. That's, uh, that's the biggie. Uh, as a, this is a general statement that applies to other states to some degree. It certainly applies to Virginia. And that is multi-hospital healthcare systems dominate the delivery of healthcare in Virginia. Healthcare is hospital centric and it's not just individual hospitals all competing with each other, they are, they are bundles or conglomerates of hospitals. The, ho the hospital industry is so concentrated that health systems exercise oligopolistic power. You know, I'm sure you all know what, what oligopolistic means, but it's very similar to monopolistic, except that maybe instead of being just one monopolist, you have power shared between two or three dominant players in a market. Anyway, the health systems exercise this power when negotiating rates with insurance carriers and also keeping out competitors. Another key point is that in Virginia, at least, most nonprofit hospitals in the industry, hospital industries dominated by nonprofits, are in fact actually very profitable. So rather than kind of go market by market, uh, you know, Virginia is a, is a diverse state. We have Northern Virginia as the biggest metropolitan area as part of the Washington metropolitan area with Hampton Roads, uh, the second largest metro area, Richmond, the third, and then kind of uh, Roanoke is the fourth largest area. Uh, I'm gonna focus just on Hampton Roads because what's happening there is not untypical of what's going on uh, in other markets around the state and presumably around the country. So 
what I did is compared up all the net, uh, uh, the net patient revenues for all the hospitals, that's acute care, psychiatric, ambulatory surgery centers, you name it, all the hospitals contained in Virginia Health Information Database. And it turns out that Centera Health System controls 51% of the entire market in this metropolitan area of roughly 1.6 million people. Number two player is another health system, a smaller health system called Riverside. And then you have uh, Bon Secours, the Catholic uh, hospital chain, has a significant presence in Hampton Roads, but it comes in third. The other 18% consists of a couple of independent hospitals and psychiatric hospitals and, uh, and, a, and, a, and a handful of ambulatory care surgery centers. That's it. So you can see the system is totally dominated by by Centera. Drilling down on that a little bit, you can see that Centera, I don't expect you to read all the details on this, just focused on what's in the circle in red. Uh, Centera has uh, 12 major facilities in the Hampton Roads area. They generate a net patient revenue of about $2.5 billion. And they have a profit margin of about 9.6%. Now, we all want healthy hospitals. We don't want hospitals that are you know, losing money and uh, scrimping and making shortcuts and doing all sorts of unproductive or counterproductive things. Uh, we want healthy hospitals that can uh, have, generate the cash flow to, to grow and expand and acquire new technologies. The rule of thumb in the hospital industry is that a healthy hospital has a profit margin of about 3%. So when Sarah Santera has a profit margin of 9.6%, that's way more than is required. That's, you might say that's excess profit. And uh, the concentration that I showed in the earlier graph of 51% actually kind of understates the control of the marketplace. Uh, Hampton Roads, uh, you might know what it is, the Virginia Beach, Norfolk metropolitan area really is kind of cleaved down the middle by the James River. And uh, the, the north of the river and south of the river, the river is very, very broad at that point, is, is connected by two, two um, bridge tunnels. And so they really function as uh, almost two separate economies. So the economy south of the James River is where Santerra is dominant. There are about $3.3 billion in hospital revenues there. And Centera owns 62% of that market share. Not only does it dominate the hospital uh, revenues, it owns the Centera Medical Group with 567 physicians. And it owns the Centera Health Plan. So it owns, it is a uh, integrated, vertically integrated uh, uh, monopoly that dominates hospitals, physicians and insurance. Now, the really interesting thing about this market south of the James River is that there are only two unaffiliated ambulatory surgery centers south of the James. Only two that aren't affiliated with, uh, with a healthcare system or an independent hospital. Those two independent facilities, which represent the real competition, account for about one third of 1% of the hospital industry revenue. So you can see how extraordinarily concentrated it is. <coughs> now, what difference does that make? What does uh, cartel pricing power and monopoly control of your market get you? Well, this information, this uh, visual comes from Virginia Health Information, which makes a stab at providing some kind of transparency into the healthcare costs in Virginia. Now these are statewide costs here, not Hampton Roads costs. Hampton Roads costs might vary. They might be even worse than these. Uh, but what, it, what this chart does, it takes the cost of a colonoscopy. That's a common procedure. And uh, the cost varies widely depending upon where it is done. So depending on whether it's an ambulatory surgery center, as seen here, a physician office, as seen here, or a hospital outpatient, as seen here. Costs can vary from, you know, about uh, 
2,000 plus dollars to 3,000 plus dollars. You look at the facility cost, okay? These other costs here, these are all doctors and anesthesiologists and nurses and stuff like that. The facility cost on average is $934 for an ambulatory sur surgery center. On average, for a hospital outpatient setting, it's $2,000. A physician office doesn't charge for, uh, for facilities, but it really marks up their physician charges. So they come out about equal with ambulatory surgery centers. But this difference here, the delta between ambulatory surgery centers and hospital outpatient is about more than $1,000. And that represents a huge premium. Now, when almost all colonoscopies are performed in hospital settings, as opposed to ambulatory surgical centers, because there are no ambulatory surgical centers, you can see what that does to drive up the cost of colonoscopies. Now we can go through procedure by procedure, and I'll just give you a couple examples. Um, rotator cuff surgery. You can see here, there's a difference of almost six thousand, five and six thousand dollars in cost between a hospital out outpatient and ambulatory surgical center. Tonsillectomies, three thousand, uh, two thousand five hundred dollars difference in cost between hospitals and ambulatory surgery centers. So this is one of the mechanisms by which, by stifling competition, um, Centera bolsters its 9.6% profit margin. Now, how, do, how, do the, how are these uh, cartels created? This is not, cartels are not the result of the workings of the free market system. They are the direct result of state government policy. There is a law in Virginia called the Certificate of Public Need. Many other states have this, although some have either shrunk it down or uh, declawed it or eliminated it entirely, but many states have it. The Certificate of Public Need creates major barriers to entry to anybody trying to enter a, a marketplace. Uh, you have to go through this uh, approval process, which, takes, which can take months and months and months and thousands and thousands of dollars of uh, legal expenses. And in that approval process, it is not incumbent upon the existing incumbents who wish to stifle competition. It's not incumbent, incumbent upon them to show that competition would be harmful. It is incumbent upon the newcomer to demonstrate that there is a public need for its service. Well, as you can imagine, it, uh, the system uh, is designed for the incumbents like Santerra to manipulate to protect their, their markets. And in fact, as one of our contributors at Bacon's Rebellion, I haven't done this, neither, uh, he has, uh, Jim Sherlock, and he has demonstrated conclusively, he's gone through the whole history of how Centera has used the certificate public need process to block interlopers from entering the Hampton Roads market. Uh, as a consequence, as I say, only two independent ambulatory surgery centers. And it gets a point to a point where, of course, people just go, it's not even worth trying. It's just a total waste of money. We're going to lose. We're not going to get it. So why don't we even try? So that is one of the big mechanisms. That's probably the dominant mechanism uh, that drives up healthcare costs in Virginia. But there's a second thing that's kind of related to it. And that's the fact that there is zero price transparency in the marketplace. I use the word marketplace very loosely. The fundamental defining characteristic of a marketplace is, what, is a place where you go and you can shop and you can haggle over prices and you know what the prices are. Uh, whether it's the ancient Greek uh, or, uh, agora or modern online, you know, uh, getting online and, 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 and comparison shopping that, price shopping that way. The key is you surface prices and compare prices. And there is no compare, a price comparison, uh, price shopping in the healthcare sector. It is, you almost kind of wonder if you can even call it a marketplace. 
let me just give just a, 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 a personal example. A couple of years ago, I had to have a hip replacement surgery. I thought, well, gosh, hip replacement, that's a high volume procedure. There's lots of them, you know, there's thousands of them done every year in Virginia. It's totally routine. It's predictable. You can, you know, you know, it's not an urgent thing. It's not like you're like in the ambulance going to the, uh, with a heart attack to the, going to the emergency room. You can plan ahead. You can shop around. You can say, where can I get the best deal? So I went to the Virginia Health Information Database and they told me that on average, Hip replacements cost $30,000 a year. Well, that's kind of interesting, I guess, but I want to know what's my surgeon going to call, charge me and what's my hospital going to charge me. And, and Virginia Health Information couldn't tell me that. So I asked my surgeon and he said, oh, well, I don't know. I, I really don't know what we're, we're, we're going to charge you. You have to business, I asked the business office for that. Uh, for that information. That's just not something that really concerns me or involves me. And then I asked, I asked my hospital, I said, well, how much is it going to charge? And they said, well, we don't know. I guess it just kind of depends on how long you stay and, you know, what kind of, if you suffer any complications, this or that or whatever. They just couldn't, they couldn't, they couldn't tell me. And even if they could tell me what they charge normally, uh, they couldn't tell me what, what happened, what my, my health insurance policy would cover what it wouldn't cover. So it's like, what would the out-of-pocket out expense to be depending on the particular health insurance company I had? So it is impossible to know under the most benign circumstances, a hip replacement surgery, to know what anything costs. Therefore, it's impossible with comparison shops. The whole idea of, uh, of a marketplace is ridiculous. There's no incentive to shop because third payer third party payers, and there's no way to shop, even if you wanted to, if you felt really socially responsible to get the best price you possibly could. So that is a huge problem, and that allows hospitals to, it basically nullifies any hope of having any consumer uh, pressure on, on, on the providers, and no consumer power at all. So, <clears throat> which kind of brings me to another interesting topic, it's like, what? What motivates these nonprofit hospitals anyway? I mean, why does Sun Six Centera need a 9.6% profit margin? Why doesn't one of its motives, why doesn't it say, gosh, we can give that back to our, our patients? We know that healthcare costs are out of control. We know it's hurting people. Why don't we reduce our charges and help our patients? Somehow they never do that. Not for profits, don't ever do that. You know, the amazing thing, they aren't greedy capitalists. It's not like they have shareholders who are trying to maximize their return. Uh, and just so you know, not for, for for-profit hospitals uh, have very small market share in Virginia, and they have zero market share in, in Hampton Roads. So, uh, of course, no wonder they pay taxes, income taxes, they pay, you know, property taxes, and they're competing against people who don't pay those taxes. So it's no wonder the nor the for nonprofits have a huge advantage. I think of the nonprofits like colleges and universities basically as mechanisms for transferring wealth from patients to the elites who manage those institutions. So why do nonprofit hospitals like Centera need so much profit? Well, for one thing, they need to grow their empires. They need capital to not just improve the quality of the service and uh, expand the service for a growing population, but to consolidate physicians practices, to launch insurance companies, to build more facilities in other markets. Bigger is better. It may be no benefit to the patients, but to them, the people who run the show, bigger is better. A really classic example is here in Richmond, my hometown, uh, there was a philanthropist by the name of Bill Goodwin who was willing to spend $350 million to underwrite the cost of building a state-of-the-art children's hospital in Richmond. And it would be a research hospital. It, it was just sounded phenomenal. And he was willing to put in this massive amount of his own personal fortune. Virginia Commonwealth University also wanted to build a children's hospital. And they wanted to bill it no matter what Bill Goodwin, how much money he was willing to contribute. 
And in effect, it was very controversial in this area for a number of years. And they basically squatted on his proposal. And he said, I give up. You go ahead and build your hospital. So therefore, the, the children patients of the Richmond area uh, are missing out on $350 million worth of philanthropy because of VCU's uh, desire to control every aspect of the marketplace. The other big driver of hospitals is to maximize prestige. Many of the healthcare systems are associated with medical schools. So you have VCU in, uh, in Richmond, and VCU has its own hospital and healthcare school. Uh, Norfolk has Eastern Virginia Medical School. Charlottesville has the University of Virginia Medical School. Roanoke has the uh, Carilion um, uh, Virginia Tech Medical School. And uh, the more prestigious the medical school, the more pre prestigious the hospital, the more prestigious the organization. And let me tell you, when you're not after, pre after when you're not trying to maximize profits, you're trying to maximize status and prestige. There is no Virginia, uh, medical school in Northern Virginia, but Innova, which is the big healthcare system of there, they have developed something very similar, which is the Center for Personalized Medicine, uh, which is uh, they're pouring tens of millions uh, of dollars into uh, in order to advance the state of the art in personalized medicine. You know, medical schools are wonderful, they're great. Um, centers for personalized medicine are great. These are all things that we want, desire, uh, but should they be financed through excess profits uh, achieved at the rate, uh, at the expense of higher rates on patients? That is a big question that no one seems willing to address. Uh, one more thing is uh, that, that kind of comes out of hospital pricing power is cost shifting. Hospitals have the ability to shift costs, and there's a lot of cost to shift. So according to 2019 American Hospital Association study, Medicare reimbursements, this is nationally, reimbursement hospitals uh, fell $54 million, billion short of costs. Medicare reimbursements fell, uh, I say 52 billion, I think that's a typo. I think it's 20, 22 or 23 billion uh, short of cost. But you add it all up, it's, it's you know, uh, in the realm of uh, $70 billion. Uh, so government can get away with this, Fed, Medicare and, and Medicaid can get away with this because they are what economists call monopsonies. They're kind of the, 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 the buyer side of monopolies. You have one dominant buyer, you exercise control in the marketplace, people have no choice. They have to buy for you, they have to pay, uh, they can only charge what you are willing to pay. And that's what Medicare and Medicaid do, and so hospitals have to make up the difference somewhere. How do they make up the difference? They cost shift. They charge more to the least powerful players in the marketplace, which is the insurance companies. And so insurance companies then stick it to the people, the private insurance player, payers. And that's one of the reasons why it costs $26,000 a year to, for a family to, uh, to buy healthcare insurance. Um, so, okay, we talked about cost shifting. So uh, let me go, uh, one more thing, yes. Um, medical licensure, I know that's something that, uh, that, that uh, the Cato Institute, various other groups have, have talked about this, and they've explained that uh, when you, when occupation, medical occupations basically uh, get captured control of the regulatory process, and they get to decide who, wh what the qualifications are to enter that occupation. How usually that takes the form of how much education uh, is required to 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 enter the profession. And what you see is over time, you see the kind of relentless, slow but steady creep of increasing the requirements. More education, more expensive education, longer education. The more education, the higher the barriers to entry into that occupation, creates scarcity, benefits the people who are in the uh, profession already, they get to enjoy the scarcity value created by the barriers of entry. Uh, they get to charge more, and of course that means uh, ta uh, ha hospital patients, uh, their patients pay more. 
Now, the, the, the impact of scarcity on compensation is well known and well discussed. I'd just like to make, make one other point. I liken the, these professions to the, and the rigid boundaries they set between the professions. Doctors can, only doctors can do X, Y, and Z. Only uh, uh, nurses can do this. Only therapists can do this. And all this, there's all sorts of different kinds of nurses and uh, gradations of this and that, and then all sorts of subcategories of all these professions. And it's all very rigid. And uh, so it is very much like uh, a, a craft unions. And rigid boundaries limit the flexibility of healthcare providers to devise new approaches to delivering healthcare. Just as unions stifle productivity and innovation in other industries, uh, licenses stifle innovation and productivity in the delivery of healthcare. I think this is the most least appreciated driver of healthcare out there. There's lots of innovation when it comes to technology, new M uh, MRI scanners and diagnostic scanners and new pharmaceuticals and targeted cancer fighting drugs. There's lots of competition there and new innovation. But when it comes to the delivery of healthcare, healthcare is delivered basically the same way it was 20 or 30, 40 years ago. Uh, the only difference is that hospitals have become, and healthcare systems have become more powerful, powerful and economic, uh, exercise more monopoly control. So how did it get this way? This is where we get to the political economy part. Here in Virginia, uh, the, public, the Virginia Public Access Project has kept track of spending on healthcare, uh, I mean, on, on political campaigns at a state level and federal level uh, for the last 24 years. The healthcare sector has spent a, over $100 million on influencing political campaigns over the last 24 years. It is the fourth most powerful uh, industry in the state. The other three, as you can imagine, retail sector, the financial sector, especially the real estate construction sector, are highly regulated by the state. And they also have tremendous interest in influencing public policy. So as a result of this, and again, my colleague Jim Sherlock has, has demonstrated this vividly on the blog. Uh, the hospital industry has its hooks deep into a number of legislators who will constantly do their bidding and introduce legislation they're looking for. There is a, another mechanism by which the healthcare industry influences public policy and that is regulatory capture. So this is kind of stuff that basically goes on outside the legislative process. It is, takes, it's more concerning with regulation. It's almost never covered by the newspapers or media of any kind. And so kind of obscure and out of the way and media doesn't have any resources to cover anything anyway. So, uh, but, so as for an example, uh, the State Board of Medicine controls uh, they oversee the licensing and the disciplining of medical professionals and they set the rules and no one else really has a whole lot to say with it unless these guys go to the legislators and say, hey, can you do X, Y, and Z for us? And uh, Joe Schmo as a, as a medical consumer or a patient, we don't know anything about what's going on. We don't know what the issues are. We have absolutely no say in this process. So as you can see, the, the State Board of Medicine has 10 doctors one osteopath, one podiatrist, one chiropractor, one former mayor, I couldn't, wasn't sure exactly what else he might do, but maybe a former government official, and three citizen members who are probably overwhelmed with information and not terribly you know, uh, up to speed on what these issues all are. That's who controls uh, licensure, and that's the way it works uh, in sector after sector. So summing it all up, uh, the political economy of healthcare is really only dimly understood because uh, the media has largely ignored this issue. Uh, Bacon's Rebellion, we're just a bunch of guys who, you know, we're trying to make a living or we're retired or we're just kind of, we're doing this part time out of our own, you know, goodness of our hearts, I guess, our own personal passion. We're not getting paid to do this. So we don't, we have very limited resources, but we have found out enough to say, I draw a few basic conclusions. And one of them is very clearly the state of Virginia regulates the health profession, the health insurance industry, and through the certificate of public need, it regulates the hospital industry. 
to various to varying degrees, the healthcare special interests have engaged in regulatory capture uh, of the regulation of these ent entities and also dominate uh, the legislation that shapes these industries. Those as generalities are impossible to deny. We can also say that consumers have no power in the marketplace, they have no power in the regulatory arena, and only a little power insofar as legislators may be responsible to, 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 to patients. Uh, little, little power in the legislative arena. And the bottom line here is the answer to runaway healthcare costs in America isn't more money. It's not expanding the Medicaid program to encompass even more people. It's not subsidizing even more health exchanges. The solution is we need to fix the power structure that regulates and designs laws that, uh, that cement hospital systems and other players in position of power and privilege uh, uh, so in which they capture uh, all these excess profits. Uh, if we can bring real competition to the marketplace, we can drive down costs and uh, dramatically reduce the need for government to intervene to make hospital more affordable uh, for the general population. So that wraps it up. I probably talked way too long, uh, but I'm happy to take any questions. All right. Well, we definitely have some questions popping in here, and I kick it off myself with a couple here. One, of course, it's exhibited as usual, <clears throat> the few trying to control the many, which is a very unfortunate set of circumstances. And then, you know, beyond some of what you described with licensure, you know, the fact that it, it typically seems to age the people that have licenses. It gets harder for younger people to enter. So the whole group of licensed people keeps getting older and older and then mass, they all retire. And then what happens? There's this huge void. And the other thing which is mirroring that was the idea of what taxi cab medallions in New York City used to cost or be worth before Uber showed up. Because once that you didn't need that license, so to speak, and anyone could drive, what yeah. do you know? Suddenly there was that price transparency that you were really talking about. So, but how, you know, is, in terms of, you know, switching out government and whatever, you know, such an absolute ordeal. One of the things seems like more doable in some respects would be how do, we, how do you break the back of the idea of the certificate of public need? That's really, really hard. People have been trying to do that in Virginia for uh, a couple of decades, literally. And uh, uh, that's when it was driven by Republican legislators, mostly. Uh, now the Republicans are out of power. And frankly, I have no idea how you how you break the back of certificate public need. Because you know that, and then the other one you described, where that organization is completely vertical. I mean, you know, in a normal world, there wouldn't allow you know in their mind you can't be in that monopoly. But yet, at that hospital, like you said, they're the hospital, they're this, they're this facility, they're the insurance company. I mean, how do they not fix every price and everything that they do in an environment like that? Yeah, but that, that's, that's even allowed to stand. You know, the way, I, the way we've been trying to tackle with Bacon's Rebellion is just saying, look at what it costs, okay? And at some point, you know, American people have got to revolt. And, you know, some people have got to go, well, we have two ways of going about this. The Democratic Party way is basically, let's say, increase subsidies, increase taxes, subsidize, subsidize, you know, uh, and, and, and treat the symptoms of the disease. I would like to say the Republican solution, but there really is no Republican solution, is waiting a political party to adopt us. That solution would be, say, let's attack the root problems. Let's understand the political economy. Uh, let's understand how these healthcare systems and other groups are uh, exercising their power to rip everybody off, and let's fight for more comp marketplace competition, create a real marketplace. How you do that, uh, that's gonna be a long battle, my friend. All right, well, there you go. All right, I see you got some hands up for sure. So let's start out with Paul. I see you got your hand up. Yes, uh, great presentation, by the way. Um, yeah, I, I, I wanted to take a moment, if we could, and, and focus on uh, the will of the people 
uh, so to speak. Uh, it seems to me that uh, one of the things that's really needed um, to break up this power struggle is to educate the public. Um, now, there may be very much an interest level problem um, in, in this in this uh, task. Um, you know, everyone is uh, very social media focused and, and very, uh, you know, quick fix kind of focused. Um, how do you, I guess, you know, I'll just kind of raise the question, how, um, going along with the merits of, you know, trying to promote the free market healthcare system, how specifically can you reach the people and pique the interest um, to make them aware and, and to kind of re-educate the, the, well, I guess first of all, is that is that a common goal here? Do you think uh, to to try to reach the the general public, or or just go after the power? You know, uh, the, yeah, the, uh, yeah. I, power I, I'd love to think there's some kind of ju, you know uh, jujitsu that we can perform, you know, and find some leverage point that uh, will miraculously make all this happen. I think in theory, the insurance carriers. Uh, much maligned and not without good cause because God knows all the bureaucratic, you know, costs they add to, you know, and it's the hassle they, they create uh, with, with their billing and, and reimbursements and stuff. But they theoretically could provide the leverage against the healthcare systems. Um, but first you have to understand the nature of the problem. If you don't understand the nature of the problem, more or less as I've laid it out. And I'm sure that my, my explanations can be greatly refined. Uh, but if you don't understand the nature of the problem, you're not gonna get anywhere. So that's the first thing you have to do is someone is needed to devote the resources to really going out and thoroughly documenting this is the way it works. Once you understand that, and then you get the lay of the land, then you can like say, okay, Let's create an advocacy group, okay? We have an advocacy group that we represent the interests of hospital, of uh, healthcare patients. That's what we represent, you know? Uh, the patients themselves, Mary, the citizens themselves probably won't pay a lot of money into this, but maybe you can get some sort of foundation. It's what all the liberal groups do. They all get foundation money for everybody who can go out and represent their interests. And then maybe you can at least engage the public that way. Um, you know, and maybe if you can get some support from insurance carriers uh, who would love to see a public, you know, uh, a public movement to kind of break down the health systems, then maybe we can accomplish something. And Jeff, you know, if I can follow up on that just briefly, uh, because, you know, I, I am doing a, a documentary on the subject, uh, you know, that I'm trying to get out there, the, you know, I'm trying to get the film out there and educate the public that way. If we could form an advocacy group you know, the way that you're talking about, um, you know, and, and then bring on the, uh, the insurance companies and, and, and those guys, um, you know, perhaps that is a way forward. Um, and, and maybe that's something we can discuss more. Worth a try. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Uh, David, I see you've got your hand up. And while you've got it up for a minute, I'm going to show Paul's got this documentary. I'm going to bring that up in the background. Go ahead, David. Did I get you there, David? Well, let me see if I can catch instead of David there. How about Kishore? I'm unmuted now. Okay, go ahead, David. Start out, and then I'll come back to the shore. Okay. Uh, Jim, let's face it. The power structure is not responsive. So rather than focusing on uh, fixing the power structure, uh, do we need to instead bypass the structure so free market can provide solutions? Uh, and in terms of education, the best form of education is actual free market examples like cash basis healthcare. So uh, your thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, maybe the only thing that's gonna really disrupt the system is you know, uh, have a entrepreneurial uh, approach that's so radical, so different. Um, for example, I mean, if we could change one law and that is uh, uh, allow or make insurance companies 
reimburse procedures that are provided outside the state. Uh, in some cases, they do. Uh, I'm thinking, for example, the, there is a company in India, uh, there is a hospital in India um, that became an expert in uh, heart surgeries. And they did thousands and thousands and thousands of these every year, and they became extraordinarily efficient. It's what some people theorists call uh, focused factories. And, you know, so uh, they did so many and they had exactly, they trained all the nurses and the doctors and they'd seen every problem there was and knew how to take care of it. They had all the right equipment. They had this, the, the, the physical layout that, that it suited their, their, their process. And then what they did is they, they, took this, they took this model, they brought it to the island of Grand Cayman in the Caribbean. And uh, the last time I checked into it is their, their average cost was about one third of what, what it is in Virginia to say to have a, a hip replacement surgery. Uh, they do hip replacements as, as well as, as, as heart surgeries. Uh, well, in, like, for these big ticket items, if it, they, 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 what they will do is that you go through and get your hip replacement and then we'll put you up on a, in, a, in a hotel after you get out of the hospital and put you up in a hotel on Seven Mile Beach while you recuperate for a week. And it's still cheaper than getting a hip surgery done in the, United States, in, in the United States. So, you know, if we can open it up to uh, offshore competition or even interstate competition, I mean, they have some of these factories, uh, focus factories in, in Texas and other places. Uh, maybe that would force people to begin competing. Maybe you just have to do something like really, really radical like that. Um, that's, that's all I can that's, think of. Maybe no, other, and then, no, you're right on the money, and we're going to actually drift into that in a minute here. Kishore, I've got you unmuted at the moment. Can you unmute yourself? <laughs> okay, so, okay, I got it, sorry. Uh, so a couple of things that, you know, when you're talking about, about um, hospital monopolies, uh, it's hard to talk about them without uh, taking into consideration the impact the pricing of Medicare has on consolidation. Um, so which raises the question about, you know, the ideology that drives all this, uh, the, the subsidies or the indirect costs of having uh, welfare in healthcare. Um, you know, what we think is great that the elderly are getting care is actually costing them a lot. Um, it's, uh, it's like, you know, there are opportunity costs to senior health care, which uh, have not been uh, discussed uh, enough and uh, what consequences it has. Uh, and the other issue uh, I, feel, I feel that is not adequately uh, discussed um, is the impact it has on employers. Now, employers, uh, I believe that they're already aware of the huge costs uh, of uh, hospital consolidation and they're financed um, a study by the RAND Corporation, which is in co un uncovering a lot of good data on um, pricing of medical services. So I'm, I'm really curious uh, what impact that will have. Because, uh, I mean, of course, employers have an escape mechanism that they can become self-insured um, self and then they can seek competitive services. But that also, it doesn't seem like it's happening to the extent that it could because of this third party network that they eventually have to fall back on uh, and the brokers and all that. Um, so it seems like and two things uh, are not uh, not discuss adequately. One is the monopsony of uh, Medicare uh, and the lack of transparency, which uh, means that the employers end up uh, buying high cost healthcare um, together with the role that th third party administrators play in the delivery of the service. Yeah. Yeah, I think those are two. Those are, 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 are very important things. I didn't address them because they ultimately uh, don't uh, stem from state level regulation. Uh, but there's no question that's more of a federal, those are more federal issues. But you're absolutely right. They're absolutely critical. 
Uh, I nearly made the decision to talk about the, the issue of uh, employer sponsored healthcare, but decided to take it out because my speech was, my talk was getting too long as it was. But uh, and we all know how employer healthcare originated. It was like as a, 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 a tax free benefit that employers could operate, uh, offer during World War II to get around wage and price controls. And just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And ultimately, that was the, became the primary mechanism by which healthcare was provided to, to all Americans. Uh, there's a, there's a couple of problems here is the, what happens then is the insurance companies design insurance products that appeal to employers, not to individuals. And, uh, so they might have, you know, a gold plan and a silver plan and a bronze plan, and then maybe an HMO or PPO, whatever you have a different couple, couple of different choices, but ultimately, uh, they're, they're structured very similarly and they're structured for the convenience of the employers. And one of the things where the interest of employers departs from those of employees is that employers look at their, at their, at their, uh, their situation and they go, well, we have lots of employee turnover. So maybe we have turnover of 10% a year or 20% a year, depending on, on the industry. And uh, so when you have a lot of turnover, you don't have a lot of incentive to put together health plans that are with large preventive uh, aspects that may not pay off for two or three, four years. Um, uh, because the benefits will be accrued to people who no longer are with your company or will leave your company. So they just don't, you know, so generally what, what the employers do is they just go in, well, we'll just put it out for bids and we want the lowest possible price we can get. And that's that. And that's the way most employers do it. There are a few people who are more enlightened, uh, but that's the way most people do it. As opposed to insurance companies going, oh, well, we're going to sign a four or five year contract with you. And we're going to take care of you for a four or five year period. And one of the things we're going to do is we're going to create all sorts of inducements in there for you to uh, stop smoking, exercise more, lose weight. And, you know, uh, if you do all these things and, and meet all these different health parameters, we'll reduce how much, you know, you have to pay in insurance. So instead of paying $26,000 a year for your family, uh, wow, maybe you'll have to pay $20,000 a year, whatever. So one thing that you could do, one kind of jujitsu move is if you could say, stop giving the tax break for insurance, for medical insurance, healthcare insurance, to the employers, but give them to the individual. So the individual would have the power to get these, uh, to uh, they, the insurance companies would go after them and create product, products that would appeal to them. So that's one example of something that could have very far reaching impact if we could get that thing through. Very good. I'm going to keep us moving here. We got time for one last question. Amazingly, we're already at that point. Mark, I've got you unmuted. All right, so I'll be quick. And um, you know what? You just segued right into exactly what I was about to say. Um, and um, Jeff, Beverly Gosage is a perfect candidate for a future presentation talking about exactly that where we talk, where we get into the individual pool rather than an employer group pool. And the other thing I wanted to um, identify is, you know, these presentations, I've heard, wow, I've heard free to care, um, citizens for health, um, freedom hub, it's in and of itself. Um, all of these organizations trying to, um, you know, the cash pay process and um, you know, I, I did a research project not too long ago where um, if we pay prepaid in cash, um, every single person out of thousands of, that I had my staff call out of thousands um, offered at least a 54% discount in the fee. That's all. Yeah. Well, look, you, you strip out all these administrative costs, bureaucracy costs. And it, yeah, I mean, that absolutely ought to be encouraged. I have to say, and I want to thank both you for being here today. Obviously, this was quite good. And, you know, sadly, some of what you did, you've pointed out the obvious, but yet it's, it's hardly being spoken about. 
it, it's not exciting enough. You're not like burning any building or something to get yourself on the news and then suddenly say, forget the building. I wanted to really tell you about the healthcare costs, <laughs> you know, and use a bait and switch in that regard. But I have to tell you, though, you're, you're quite the setup because, you know, in our relentless search for what are we going to do next? We have a sponsor with us, and so this is like the perfect setup for what you were describing there. Let me kick over this thing. This is a, a, an image of this app, and of course, what did it take? A doctor to figure this out. Now, this particular doctor was three different things, so it's like anything. You gain your experience off of your past experiences. So first, he was an emergency room doctor. Then he was an administrator at the hospital chain in Dearborn, Michigan. So just like you described all those, and I'm in Cleveland with the Cleveland Clinic, so I can totally relate to your description there. And then he became an employer, started his own clinic, and suddenly he had to buy health care for his workers. So he lived every horror of health care and said, this is like ridiculous. I'm billing Blue Cross $300, $200, whatever it is, to get 75 bucks. Isn't there a way I could just like get this? So here's what he did. It took him four years, 20 some developers, won awards, and he's built a few cool things in here that kind of addresses what we were talking about, why we're putting a lot of our wind behind these sales. Let's take a look through this app, as it were. I want to book an appointment. I click on that. I type in, hey, I need back surgery. I want to know the whole country. I want to know worldwide, whatever my focus is. I want to know 10 miles from my house, whatever my circumstances are. Everyone that's in there, they have to put their cash price all in, no hidden billing, no nothing. Everything is 100% transparent. When I book it, though, here's the cool part. I have to prepay for the appointment at the time I booked that knee surgery for 13 grand. I pay for it when I book it. Now I show up at that surgery center, all prepaid. They do the surgery and then they hit a button and they get paid. No IDC codes, no billing, no waiting, no nothing. And that price for that surgery, they dictate it. And where the operation makes money is just like Amazon. If the surgery is 13,000 bucks, they add a couple hundred bucks to the cost and that's the cost of the app's operation. So the app is free to the doctor, free to the consumer, free to the employer, everybody's free. But like when Mark brought up as a good example, actually Kishore, when you, have this program and I'm the employer and I say, hey, all my employees, you need to bring down this app to get to the health plan we have here at work. But guess what? Whenever you book anything, you got to book it through this app and everything's cash price. And if the insurance product for the large employer is built into this and we're taking on others, but it operates like a self-insured situation, we deliver the money to you. So Jim, you're getting that knee surgery and we say, hey, you know what? That's a $15,000 best price, but you find a guy willing to do it for 13. You get to keep the two grand. The two grand saying you can't take it out and put it in your pocket. It's in this wallet. But guess what? Now I can go look up and say, hey, you know what? I want to get the kids need braces. Boom. That's where I'm going to spend that two grand. So everyone's incentivized to find the best price and to get the best situation. So just like this whole walk away thing. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of this walk away campaign, but this is the guy that decided the Democratic Party left him and he walked away. He says, I can't wait for someone to get voted in or whatever it is. And so we've been of the same mindset too. So we can't stop doing like what you prescribed, but you know what really, the doctors and the patients just need to say, you know what, forget that nonsense. I don't need insurance. I don't need government. We're just gonna get together the two of us and call it a day. And now the costs are going to be straightforward. Everyone knows what it is. And just like you said, the two health programs and there's others coming in here now, they're catering to the consumer because we're saying, hey, you know what? It's a lot better if you shop around because you bring the price down. And even though we're supposedly a cash pay world right now, there's no comparison. I, I use the analogy of pulling up to the corner and there's five, four gas stations. Now I know what the price of gas is. And all of the other guys that sell gas, they know what I charge. And if I'm suddenly 10 cents less and I got lines out of my building and they've got zero, something's got to give. So the same thing is what this app is bringing to the market. So if you go to wowadvocates.com and click on sign me up, actually just send you some information. But the, what they do, and there's a cool part, just to spill it a little more of the beans. If it's the 50 plus employer package, they put $500 or a thousand if you're a family in your online wallet the day you sign up. Because for most employees, like you said, all those numbers you spit out before, most people don't get sick. Most people don't have a heart attack. So all that money sucked out of their family's lifestyle for what? For nothing. 
because when I got to get my teeth cleaned, I got to pay for that anyway, on top of all of what you just described. So here they're giving me back some of my premium costs as well as an allocation in my wallet as, a, as an annual stipend, and I can spend it any way I see fit on that app. And if I trigger the deductible, so to speak, then when they adjudicate and figure out what the cost should be, they give the money to me. And then I go on the app and book where I'm going. No mark, no network, no physicalities, no tie-ins, no anything. I can go anywhere in the world I want to go because I'm in control of the money in my wallet. So it's a great panacea. So we're, you know, pushing like you because it's it's coming down to we gotta like destroy this situation like death by a thousand paper cuts. And that's kind of what this represents. So it was great that you were here today and you know, th these are the solutions starting to spill out of the problem that you were just describing because that's how creativity occurs when there's a problem and, and we're getting there. So this was great and I appreciate all that you've been doing. And we definitely want to remind everybody you want to come back and this will be listed in the credits, but you're going to want to definitely get in connected to and subscribing to the Bacon's Rebellion. So thanks again for being here today, Jim. Thanks, Jeff. It's a pleasure. Thanks, everybody. Thank <laughs> you.